Let me introduce Steve. Steve uh, is an entrepreneur in the purest sense of the word. He currently owns and operates three companies and sits on the board of several others. His companies include Utah Broadband, Alpine Networks, and Sunbrook Properties. Utah Broadband is one of the largest and most successful wireless broadband companies in the Western United States. He started in 2002 and is one of the, and it's now one of the fastest growing, most reputable internet providers in Utah. In fact, I'm a customer of it, and they're, they're, great. they're great. Alpine Networks builds, owns, and leases communication towers. Sunbrook Properties is a real estate investment company with multiple properties in various states. Prior to starting Utah Broadband, Stephen held several positions, including an executive director of business development, sales, and international at Talk to, Techno Talk to Technology, Inc., a telecommunications software engineering firm. Before Talk To, he held various management positions in Franklin Covey Company, including manager Southeast Area of the Southeast Area Office in Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. McGee has a passion for creating and growing businesses. He also founded other companies, including a fly fishing shop called The Hideout and an international export and distribution company called Intex. Stephen has a wife and seven children. On top of spending time with his family, he enjoys fly fishing, golf, and other outdoor activities. Stephen graduated from Brigham Young University with a Bachelor's of International Business and a minor in German. Just a personal aside, I, I just want to mention that Steve is one who gives back to the community. Just to give you an example, last year for their company Christmas party, he gave all of his staff a gift card and a list of about 50 plus foster children and uh, sent them out to get Christmas gifts for each of their kids, for each of these foster kids. And they brought those all back and made a lot of kids here in, in our state very happy from doing that. Anyways, let's give Steve a round of applause and welcome him here today. Good morning. It's, uh, very, uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, I was uh, a little bit nervous when I walked into the business school and I was walking down the hall and I glanced to the side and saw a picture of myself um, in the hallway. It's kind of like walking into the post office and turning around and looking behind you and seeing your picture on the wanted board. Uh, I, I am uh, I'm humbled to be here and the reason I say that is because as I was thinking about what I could share with you, what, what I might share that would be different or impactful, I had the, I had the impression that there are some among you who are going to have a big impact uh, in the world, whether that's from service that you do, whether that's from some product innovation, some business idea or technology. I just my gut told me that there were people in here who were going to who are going to impact the world for better. My hope is that each of you, I'll be able to share something with you that will help each of you reach your potential. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm very honored to be here and I appreciate Brad's invitation to join you. Let's see, before I get started, let me, uh, let me start with a story. Some of you may have heard this story before and if you, if you know the, the answer, just keep it yourself. There was a woman, a businesswoman, who was over in England on a business trip, and she was preparing to fly back to the United States, and she uh, decided she had a little bit of a layover, so she decided to run into the bookstore and grab a book. Long layover, long flight. So she ran into the bookstore, and as she was perusing the books, she noticed that there was uh, a package of cookies, Walker shortbread cookies, there in the, in the bookstore. Those were her favorite cookies, so she thought, well, why not? I have time, and, and uh, so let me grab those. So she got up to the register. She threw the cookies in the book on the, on the counter and, and uh, paid for them and, and, and left the store. So she was in the, in the waiting area reading her book, and they called for a flight. She jumped on the flight. She was seated in first class, fortunately. And as she sat down, she sat down to a distinguished-looking gentleman and uh, she politely nodded and said hello and, and uh, asked to sit down. And, and the gentleman responded, hello. And she could tell immediately that he was British and 
well-mannered older gentleman. So flight takes off and, and she's into her book and she's reading along and all of a sudden she kind of gets that pain, or, a pain, pain in her stomach, she's hungry. And so she reaches down, she opens up her bag of cookies. Well, she notices when she's opening her bag of cookies that the gentleman next to her stops what he's doing and takes a very keen interest in her opening her cookies. And she's like, well, that's just a little bit weird, but okay. So she opens her cookies, she reaches in, she grabs a cookie, downs the cookie. And meanwhile, this gentleman's watching her the whole time. So she finishes her cookie. She goes back to her book, and a second later, she hears the rattle of the wrapper, and she looks down, and this gentleman has reached into her bag of cookies, and he's helping himself to cookie, to a cookie. She's stunned, doesn't know what to say, and just kind of looks back and keeps reading her book. So she reaches down, grabs another cookie, and she eats it, and the gentleman just kind of curtly nods. And she's thinking, oh, okay, that's a little weird. And a second later, he proceeds to grab another cookie. This continues on through the flight until there's one cookie left. And she's thinking to herself, how's this going to work? So he reaches down, he grabs the cookie, he snaps the cookie in half, and offers her half of the last cookie. As you can imagine, she's beside herself at this point in time. She's furious that this gentleman would eat half her bag of cookies and then offer her half of the last cookie. Well, she doesn't say anything. She just kind of gets off the flight. She's frustrated. By this time, as you can imagine, eating a full bag of cookies or a half a bag of the cookies, as the case may be, at this point in time, she's got a little stomach indigestion. She's not feeling too well. So she runs into the bookstore as soon as she gets out. She's going for the Pepto-Bismol or whatever, whatever you get for that. She runs in. She cracks her bag to grab her wallet. And guess what she finds? Her bag of cookies. Now, for those of you who haven't heard the story or may not have guessed the outcome, what you just experienced was a paradigm shift. You just you saw the world one way up until the point at which, at which all the information was exposed to you. And at that point in time, when you had all the information, guess what? The world was turned on its ear. You saw things very differently at that point in time, did you not? My hope is that today I'll be able to share something with you guys that will give you more information that may cause you to have a little bit of a paradigm shift that will help you see things a little bit differently. Maybe not. And if I don't do a very good job, I'll know because Brad and I will be eating lunch together alone. There won't be any other guests with us. Uh, I truly hope that I'll be able to share something to help each of you reach your potential. Today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about three things. I'd like to talk about our story, give you some background on how Utah Broadband came to be and, and how we've been successful. The second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you from an employer standpoint. Just by raise of hand, how many of you have an interest in starting your own company? Okay, well, wow. So a very significant uh, uh, amount of people in here. Of those people that just raised your hand, how many of you have uh, an idea or have already started your company? You're well down the path. Let me just see by the raise of hands. So a few of you. So several of you have a desire to do that, maybe some ideas rattling around in there. A handful of you have already started, and some of you, that's just not the road you want to go, and that's great, no problem there. Well, I'm going to talk to you uh, on, on two levels. One is, if you're going to work for somebody else, what makes an exceptional employee? 
what makes me as an employer want to promote you over you for the same job? What makes me want to give you a raise and not you a raise if you're in the same role? What do employers look for? And then the last thing that I want to touch on is as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, how did we get there? What were some of the keys to our success? And, and uh, what are some of the pitfalls you should watch for? So that's, that's what I'd like to cover today. Um, I want to... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Utah Broadband. In 2002, my wife, and, and by the way, I have an awesome wife. That's one of my keys to success that we'll talk about later. But I'd like just to point out, she just came here. I just saw her walk in. So give my wife a round of applause. I don't get too many chances to embarrass her, so uh, she's at the very top back there. The other beautiful blonde, as Brad would, Brad would say. We started in 2002. I was working for a technology company, and a friend of mine, we were in the dot-com boom, and we'd raised a lot of money, and, and the owners of the company blew through the money, and pretty soon it was one of those roller coaster rides. And uh, a friend of mine who was earlier on in the company called me up and said, hey, what do you have for internet service in your neighborhood? And some of you will remember, maybe most of, our, most of you or all of you will remember, 10 years ago, the predominant form of internet service was dial-up. Some of you are young enough that you probably don't even know what dial-up is. Dial-up was a modem that made really bad screeching noises and produced about 26.6 kilobits per second. That was the predominant form of internet. And so in the few short years that we've been in business, the internet has, has changed dramatically. And several of you have been along for the ride and some of you just sort of fell into it um, when it was you know, at, at the peak. But we started because there weren't very many people who could get any kind of a high-speed internet connection. So the idea was, I had this guy come to me and say, let's do a business together. And the idea was, let's get a T1, which is 1.5 megabits per second, upload and download. Let's get that, let's put an antenna on your roof, and let's sell internet to your neighbors. Sound like a great idea. Um, so we did that. But as we were going, I said, well, wait a minute, if all of these people in my neighborhood can't see it, why don't we find a spot where instead of seeing 50 people, we can see 1,000 people? So we looked around and we went up and talked some lady into letting us put an antenna on her roof instead of my roof. That's how we started Utah Broadband. My partner at the time, his goal was to earn an extra $500 a month so that he could buy tires for his big truck that he you know, jacked up and done all this stuff. He had this sweet tripped out truck. And he just wanted to kind of get some extra money so that he could he could feed his, uh, his hobby. And uh, it wasn't too long into the, to the business, a few months, where I was like, you know, dude, you gotta, if we, customers have a problem, you gotta help them out. You can't just leave them in the lurch. And, and he, was, he had to drive down from Bountiful, it was in Sandy, and it was just too much for him. So at that time, I agreed to buy him out. And I had left that other company I did not have a salary. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Give me water. Sorry about that. I'm getting choked up already. I did not have a salary. Um, I had, at the time, five children. We had just had a baby. Sorry, I've got something in my throat. We just had a baby that was born three months premature. He was three pounds. He was in intensive care. So we had a lot of challenges when we started this company. Um, but thankfully, my wife uh, also saw the vision of what Utah Broadband could become. And so we gutted it out. And we, thank you. Oh, 
is, is one diet and one not? I'll go with the blue. <laughs> um, so I ended up buying my partner out for $11,000. That's the short end of the story. And he was the technical side of things. I was the sales side of things. So I suddenly had a tech technology company, but I didn't have a technical guy to run it. So along the way, we had a lot of a lot of challenges getting this business started. And we'll talk a little bit about those in depth as we go along. But we, we just kind of kept plugging along, plugging along, and plugging along. We had an opportunity uh, to buy a few companies and merge with another company. When we merged with this other company in 1996, so, uh, or excuse me, 1996, 2006, we, uh, we were able to acquire some technical expertise. And through that, the partnership, we had a great blend of skill sets. And we were able to really start to grow the company rapidly. And then in 2008, we were approached by several companies wanting to acquire us. If any of you remember, 2008 was a great year. It was just as the market started to collapse. Well, we sold in February, so the market was still at a high. Sold, a co sold the company to a public company out of Canada. They asked me to stay on and run the company. And, uh, and I agreed to do that. Uh, a year later, they were having all kinds of challenges. And I won't elaborate on those, but uh, I had the opportunity to buy my company back. And it was, a, it was a great opportunity. I managed to buy it back for about 40 cents on the dollar, which means for every dollar I sold it for, I only had to pay 40 cents to buy it back. So I bought it back less than half of what I sold it for. Uh, I, I can't tell you how excited I was to get back into the business. The business had so much potential, and they were totally missing it. They mismanaged and, and um, not very visionary. But one of the things that they taught us was something that allowed us to take the business and grow it rapidly. And, and since then, we've reinvented the business and, and have done phenomenal. So that's the, the overall history of Utah Broadband. We continue to get calls from people wanting to buy the business. But I kind of like what I do. I have a great group of people that I work with, and uh, it's a great business. And, and so, you know, that's, it's an exciting prospect, but I kind of like what I do. And I think that's important, that you like what you do in whatever you do. All right, so enough about Utah Broadband. I'm, let me just ask, are there any questions? I don't know that I want to do a formal Q&A afterwards. We can open it up. But if you have some questions along the way, don't hesitate to, to throw something at me or raise your hand and, and we'll tackle them at that point. Any questions about Utah Broadband and our history? Okay. Why did you buy it back? Why did you buy it back when you it was Well, great question. Interestingly enough, it was not tanking. Um, the business was not growing the way it could grow. And so I saw opportunity and, and that's, I guess that's why I started it to begin with. But they were mismanaging it and could have done so much more. And we kept saying, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And, and they just weren't seeing it. And so, you know, for me, it was a no-brainer to get it back. I, I recognized that it was a slam dunk. The good news about Internet service, even if the economy is down, people still need their Internet. I would ask you, what would be one of the last things that would go in your apartment or your home? Would it be food? Probably. Maybe you'd choose the internet before food. I don't know. That's kind of what this generation is all about. So the internet is a staple and has become literally a utility. It's like lights and heat. I suspect some of you might even choose to go without heat so that you could pay your internet bill. So I saw a great opportunity. That was a great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. What, um, what was causing them to mismanage the company? Was it the distance? They were out of Canada? Or what, what were they doing? 
So his question is, what was causing them to mismanage the company? Why was it struggling? Partly distance, they were up in Vancouver, but more so, they felt like they had to make all the decisions. They felt like we were incapable of making the decisions and running it with it on our own. So it was a control issue. And you know what? That was fine. They could run the company however they wanted because it was their company at that point in time. But I built a very successful business. They recognized it. They bought it. And my feeling was, well, I'm the guy here in the market. I know this market better than the Canadians know the Utah market. Why don't you let me run with it? And that was just not something they were prepared to do. Yeah, please. What was one of the main struggles that you had as you went from your really good idea to starting the business? Great question. His question was, what, was one of the, what were some of the main struggles as I took the idea and put it into production to generate revenue? Um, the first thing you need to have is you need to have someone that will buy your product. I think, I think there are two primary reasons why businesses get started and why they're successful. I think the first is somebody needs to see a need that is not currently being filled. So it's a product, technology, it's a business innovation. It's something new that doesn't exist. Okay, that's number one. The second thing I think that's important, and, and by the way, that wasn't the case. There were high, techno there high speed technologies available and, and so forth. But that leads me to the second point. The second point is you find something, you find a need that's being met, but maybe not met very well, so that you can innovate on that particular niche. You can take a, 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 a need that's being met, but you can meet it better. You can meet it differently. And, and so the, the other innovation is take something that exists and make it better. And to try to get people to buy your product, that's critical in the early stages. There are a lot of people who create these wonderful companies and wonderful ideas, but they forget one thing. You gotta sell something if you're, trying, if you're in a for-profit business. You gotta be profitable, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. So some of the struggles were first getting people to buy the product so we had revenue. The second and, and probably the, one of the biggest struggles we had was being able to afford people that could help us move the business forward. And we got to a certain point and the biggest challenge that I had at that point in time was I know this is a good business. I've got it to a point where it's paying us money and I can survive. We can feed the kids. We, you know, we're not living on rice anymore. So now we want to take it to the next level. How do we get that person to help us take it to the next level? Because they're going to cost money. So back we went. I had to sacrifice income for myself to get the right people in to move it forward. So those were some of the initial challenges that we had. It was just that balance of, of when to hire and how much to, to do and and finding people to actually buy the product. Great question. Anything else before I jump into the next section? Is there a hand way back there? Yeah. Um, how do you deal with competition? How do I or did I? Both. Okay, good. Um, my, my salespeople cringe when they, when they come into my office and they're asking we're in a competitive situation, a competitive bid, the easy thing to do is to lower your price and compete on price. Now, I'm the little guy in the market. I'm sure you've all heard of Comcast. I'm sure you've all heard of CenturyLink. And there are a number of others. So I'm the little guy in the market. I'm the little fish. And so com competition is fierce. As you know, there's advertisements galore for you can get all of this speed and you only have to pay this much money. Um, I won't comment on some of the, what I consider to be um, not fair advertising practices uh, that, that some people em employ. But one thing that I won't be, and my, drives my salespeople nuts, is I won't compete on price. 
Occasionally, we'll, we'll make some price concessions, but generally speaking, what we offer and why we've been successful, and you'll see this in a little bit later, is that we've been able to offer just a value to our customers. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. There may be Utah Broadband customers in here. You know we're not perfect. But we try to be responsive when you have a problem. Customer service is huge. We try to provide adequate speeds and, and, and consistent speeds for the price that people are paying. So we try to be a value-based solution as opposed to a low-cost solution. Any other questions? Okay, let's, uh, we're going to circle back to some of the stuff that we've already talked about, but those were great questions. Keep them coming. That's terrific. Let's talk a little bit about what, what we at Utah Broadband see as what do our best employees embody. And uh, many of you, even if you want to start your own company, you'll go in and work for somebody else, another company, a, a large corporation or a small business. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I spent a majority of my career doing exactly that, working for other people and trying to start businesses, and some failed, some didn't. So um, that's, that's natural. Here's, here are some things that I feel like are really important when you go to work for somebody else. This is why somebody at my company gets a raise. This is why they get promoted, this kind of stuff. Uh, the first thing, and, and let me just use some examples with some of my own employees. The names have been changed to protect the innocent or the guilty, depending on, on the, on the uh, example here. Solutions, not complaints. One of the hardest things for me to do is to deal with complaints about something, one of our processes, uh, uh, anything that we have. Because I have my, my hands full with so many other things, and to have an employee come in and just unload and complain, it, it, it starts to rattle things around in my brain. And I don't know if I'm just not capable of dealing with it or what. But I like to look at them and say, so what's the answer? What's the solution? Because in my business, we're a small business, and it's important that everybody pulls their weight. I apologize for using a sports metaphor, but I'm a sports fan. Um, some of you, well, you probably all have heard of Michael Jordan, but one of the things that made the Chicago Bulls successful at that time was that they had a lot of athletes. They didn't have a lot of specialists. They had athletes. And what allowed them to be successful was that Scottie Pippen, who could play a forward position, could also go out and guard John Stockton, a point guard. And so what we look for in our business is we look for athletes. We look for people who can do a lot of things. And if you can solve problems, you are going to be escalated in, in your employer's eyes. You can bring up the complaint, but by golly, follow it up with a, with a solution. I'll give you an example of two of our guys. Um, we're going to call them Skippy and Sparky. Uh, Sparky creates sparks. His favorite thing to do is talk about why something won't work, why this particular challenge is difficult. Skippy, on the other hand, does the exact same job day in and day out. We never hear anything from Skippy. Skippy just gets his job done. We recognize there are challenges, and occasionally the challenges are manifest in the process. So they're out installing our service, and a challenge arises that has to be thought through and talked and discussed. He'll do that. He'll involve the proper people and communicate the problem. But Skippy is a doer. He goes and he solves the problem, whereas Sparky, who's been doing it longer and has more experience, Sparky's a complainer. And Sparky had an opportunity to get an advancement recently into a new job. And guess what the number one thing was that held him back from that job? He would rather complain than he would solve the problem. And the job we were looking for required solutions. 
We couldn't hold their hands. They were out in the field building towers, doing different things. They needed to be able to solve the problem. So that's, that's number one. Number two is initiative to learn. I had a, a gentleman that joined our company maybe five or six years ago, five years ago, let's say. And we'll call him, <coughs> excuse me, we'll call him Braden. Braden uh, started out in our technical support group. Now he was kind of at the low end of the totem pole. And, and uh, he started out, did a fantastic job. Within a short period of time, he became an informal leader in the group because he trained himself on technical problems. When he had a problem that he couldn't answer, rather than just sending it up the line to the engineers, he would go up to the engineers and say, hey, here's a problem. I want to know how to solve this problem. And he used the opportunity at that point in time to suck all the information he could from other people that knew. He also started offering solutions, back to the first thing, about things that we could do to improve. And he would teach himself programming languages and other types of things to help in his job and go beyond. Quickly, the engineering team started to rely on him as kind of a, a pseudo junior engineer. Well, we decided to formalize that, and he was hands down, slam dunk, the obvious choice because he had tutored himself. Again, there were people who had been in the same job for a lot longer, but he had the initiative to learn and grow. I challenge each of you, no matter what you guys do in your field, continue to learn and grow. Trustworthy. I think trustworthiness is a function of two things, character and competence. Let me describe each of those with examples. Um, we'll, call, we'll call exhibit one Bob. Bob has, had been with us for a long time doing installations. He was good at installations. He was competent. He knew everything about it. But things were happening along the way that just didn't add up. His phone would break. His laptop, the screen would crack. He would lose tools. He would come back and say, we can't, get, we can't install this customer because of X, Y, and Z. Here are the reasons. And, and it was just kind of over time stuff was happening. And we started to clue into something. And uh, one of the people came and said, hey, uh, I just noticed your guy. He did this. He's, he may have an anger management problem. As we started to look into things, some things started to manifest themselves. We started to look at some of the sites that he said he couldn't install. Well, guess what? They could be installed. He was cheating us in several ways. And once we kind of got a clue, we realized Bob has a character problem. And we can't have Bob with the company. So he was competent, knew his job, but we couldn't trust him. Now, let me shift gears and talk about Sam. Sam, on the other hand, was a great guy. Just, I mean, you just could feel he oozed honesty and wanted to work hard, wanted to do the right thing. But guess what? Every time, not every time, several times we had to go back and fix Sam's work. Occasionally, he would cause damage to the premises that he was working on. Sam was a great guy, but was a little bit of a hurricane. You know, we were always cleaning up after him, going along. Do you think Sam lasted very long? No, we couldn't afford him. We couldn't afford to take other guys off jobs and go fix his problems. High character guy, but lack competence. Lastly, Alvin. Not the chipmunk. Uh, Alvin was, uh, is a model employee. He, he's, he just has it wired. High character guy, does the right things, works hard, does a thorough job, he nails it. So Alvin was one of those guys that quickly rose up in the ranks and became one of our senior people. Uh, passion. 
I, I don't know that I, I want to spend any time on this. I think you all know what that is. If you can get into your job and you can like it, you will love doing it and you'll be passionate about it. Whatever you do, do it great. And believe me, it's obvious. From an employer standpoint, it's obvious when somebody is engaged and fighting for the company and working hard, it stands out like a sore thumb. Uh, lastly, execution. You gotta be a doer. You gotta, you gotta get in, it's kinda back to that problem solving thing. You gotta be a doer. Take the bull by the horns and, and get stuff done. Whatever the job takes, if you have to work a little extra, don't go in and moan to your boss, hey, I had to work, can I have more time off, can I get a raise? That'll come, assuming that your employer is fair. And if they're not fair, find something else to do. Life's too short. But, but that stuff will just show up. It'll just happen for you. If you can embody some or all of these things, you'll find success in whatever you do. And by the way, these are also true of, of running your own business. All right. Um, let me, allow me to tell you a personal story. What, what's our time here? Okay. Allow me to tell you a personal story. I, uh, we had fall break and I took my family down to St. George last week and I went fishing. I hired a guide and took my boys fishing down in St. George. We went bass fishing. And I have three boys that are 13, 10, and 8. And we went fishing and, and I want to just want to talk to you about the two boys, the 13-year-old uh, and the 8-year-old, the, the oldest and the youngest. We went out and we love to fish uh, and, and I've taken my 13-year-old bass fishing a number of times so he knows how to do it. But when we got out in the boat, the guy turned to me and he said, all right, for the younger kids, we're going to fish a drop shot rig. Okay. Um, not, I haven't done that a lot, so that's great. And for you, have you done any jigging? I said, yeah, I've done some jigging. And I uh, said, my son Jace has as well. He said, why don't, we, why don't we put you two on this method and let's put the other two on this method. Okay, great. So we started fishing and he showed us some techniques that I'd never used before. Uh, I had quickly threw it out there and he watched me for a minute. He's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. I thought you said you knew how to do this. I said, well, I've done it before. I don't know that I know how to do it. Um, so he showed me and my son, and my son was a little younger, the 13-year-old, so he said, well, let's do him on a drop shot as well. So he showed the techniques to my two boys, the exact same technique, for the exact same fishing uh, method. Well, pretty soon, my oldest son, he, he, he caught some fish, but pretty soon he was reverting to some of his old practices. And he stopped catching fish. And the younger son was catching fish like one after another. I kid you not, we caught 70 fish in about three and a half hours. It was fantastic. But the oldest son was starting to get nerve, mad because he wasn't catching the same amount of fish as the younger son. And the guy said, well, you're not doing it right. And he started to get frustrated, and then he'd say, okay, and he'd start doing it right, and he'd catch fish, and then he'd revert back to his old methodologies. I'd like to kind of, I'd like to kind of relate that to, to starting a business. Sometimes it requires taking a different approach, and it requires adhering to certain principles to be successful. You can revert to your old ways, those old ways may not work. If you follow certain principles of success, you'll find success. I know it's cliche, but hard work is, is critical to being successful at having your own business. There's a, I heard a phrase just the other day, and, and uh, I don't remember where I heard it, but uh, it says, work, it's the W phrase, work will win when wishy-washy wishing won't. So you can't just wish something to happen. You gotta roll up your sleeves and you gotta work hard. Early in our company, my wife and I had a family, school, sports, all that kind of stuff, but she was running the back office and I was running everything else, sales, installation, technical support, you name it. It was frequent that I would wake up at 6 a.m., have breakfast with the family, 
work until dinner, sometimes have dinner, sometimes not, and work till two in the morning. And that wasn't just once, it was routinely, because there was so much to do. So hard work, you gotta pay the price, okay? There were a number of opportunities to quit. Being the little guy, it's not always easy. And not having funds, we started this business, we mortgaged our house, and, and that's how we survived. We didn't go raise money, we just gutted it out. And there were a number of times where the business required another significant capital infusion. It required us to change the course of the business. At that point in time, there were many times where the thought in my head was, I was earning six-figure income. I was doing pretty good. And now, not having any money, that really stinks. But you know what? We, my wife and I would talk about it, and we would decide, we're just going to keep doing this because we see that there's, that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Perseverance. Okay? Adaptability. Part of this perseverance thing was a, a, a time where we, were, we had deployed a certain technology and we recognized that technology could no longer sustain us. It was not going to be competitive. It was fraught with problems and we needed a change. It was a complete renovation of the business, a complete undertaking. But you know what? We had to adapt. We could not stay the course the way we were going. And I'll tell you another story in a little while about, again, adapting after I bought the company back. Don't be afraid to change the course as the need dictates. It's critical to your long-term success. Um, I've got a little clip that I want to share with you that illustrates the last point here. But stick to your core competency. Whatever you do, do it well. Be the best at that particular thing. We had a number of times where we, we had people in the IT arena that wanted to merge with us and become an internet and an IT shop. We had a number of people that wanted to layer their voice over IP solution. So let's offer phone and internet. Seems like a good idea. We had several different opportunities to chase down different paths. But in the end, my gut told me, do what you do best and be the best at it. So what was their core competence? They were good at it, weren't they? They stuck to their business. They are in the business of making change. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the keys to our success in the later years. Uh, I talked a little bit about reinventing the business, which we did from a technology standpoint. As, we, as I bought the company back, it was apparent that the market was, was progressing at a rapid pace. What we used to offer in terms of a speed to businesses and customers was no longer relevant. It was no longer applicable. And so we had to come up with a solution to, to be competitive into the future. I challenged my, my engineering team a couple of years ago, shortly after we bought the business, and I said, look, here's where the market is going. We're not going to be competitive in a couple of years. We have got to reinvent ourselves. We spent a lot of time and energy with the entire company thinking about how to do that. And over the last few years, we've invested millions of dollars into our network to, be, to remain relevant in our space. You've got to stay nimble and adapt. Customers, a, an absolute critical piece of your business is to treat your customers with utmost importance. 60%, almost 60% of all of our business comes from referrals. I'd venture to say that many of you have never even heard of Utah Broadband. It's okay, we don't advertise. We don't need to advertise because our business grows through referrals. Will we advertise? Yeah, we're actually engaged with an advertising company now. But if you treat your customers, you will grow naturally. If you treat them well, you will grow naturally. Um, operational efficiency. We have many times where a business moves in to a building 
and their provider comes to them when they just moved in and says, I, we can't get you internet service. Businesses don't operate real well without internet service. We routinely get calls and we can actually install those people the same day. If you have the operational efficiency, if you figured out how to deliver your product quickly and well, you'll excel. And lastly, despite what one of the presidential candidates may say, profitability is important. Um, that's a, just a joke. Don't mean to offend anybody. All right, I thought I had till one. They just informed me I have like one minute left. So I'm just gonna click this slide up and let me just, let me just point out a couple things I think that are critical. Um, failure is important. Don't run away from failure. Learn from failure. Preserve your equity. Don't be in a hurry to give your business away. And upgrade yourself. Surround yourself with great people. Lastly, on a personal note, uh, I think it's important um, to, to acknowledge um, uh, your creator, the higher power, uh, God. Uh, that's important to me and I just want to let you know that I think that's critical. You will have opportunities in your life that a lot of people don't have. I would encourage you to reach out and help other people. Extend a hand. Lift other people. Give back. And, and as you do that, you'll find great fulfillment in whatever success you achieve in, in your business uh, life. I appreciate being here. Thank you for your attention. And uh, all the best to all of you.